So this section like that I just spoke about was about how media today on the internet uh, is the same as the past. Um, now let's look at this, this thing that's slightly different. We call it the rise of fake news. Uh, and so the question that we ask is, well, why is there so much fake news? So in the ACM Chi 2018 conference, uh, I had the privilege to interview Wikimedia Foundation's Sue Gardner, who did an insightful presentation on the rise of fake news. Uh, the sales of supermarket tabloids has long indicated that people value headlines that fit what they want to see or what they suspected. I always knew that was true, even if it isn't true, it's not true. Uh, so let's look at what Sue Gardner had to say, uh, and let's talk about it. So are you ready? Here we go. Okay. And of course, she's a very proud recipient of the Ian Cap Medal of Internet Awesomeness for defending internet freedom. So welcome to the stage, Sue Gardner. <laughs> It looks like Mark Zuckerberg flying to Washington to testify in Congress. It looks like the general counsels of Twitter, Facebook, and Google also flying to Washington and testifying before multiple Senate committees. It looks like full page advertisements like this one in daily newspapers in the United States and the United Kingdom, with Facebook um, apologizing for not doing a good enough job of safeguarding user data. It looks like this woman, the UN Special uh, Investigator for Myanmar, saying that Facebook played a determining role in contributing to genocide in that country. And it looks like the government of Sri Lanka talking about hardline Buddhist groups using Facebook to distribute pain propaganda. This was one of the first indicators to me that it was wrong. I don't know if you folks remember uh, this quote. Jeff Hammerbacker uh, was one of the first employees at Facebook, and I think he was the first person to do analytics for Facebook. And I remember in some time like 2007 or 2008, I had moved to Silicon Valley in uh, 2007 to run the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit that operates Wikipedia, if you don't know that. When social media became the primary distribution mechanism for news, what that opened up was a new business opportunity. And probably most of us, many of us in the room, know the story of the Macedonian teenagers, right? These were these kids in Macedonia who um, started up news sites. And their purpose was really just to make money because if you got enough social sharing, you could put ads against it, you could make a profitable business. I think if I remember correctly, the kids were making something like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or something. So you could actually, you know, make a living wage doing this. The emotion that most predictably and consistently drives social sharing turns out to be anger. And the most efficient way to routinize the production of anger to encourage social sharing is by making hyper-partisan news. So you make political material that is highly partisan, designed to provoke anger or outrage or some surge of strong emotion. People share it on the internet, they share it on social media, and you can make money doing that. And they were the most popular news source on Twitter during the campaign. And I'll say it again, I'll kind of underline, this is stuff that is false, it is not useful information, it's not helping anybody make a good decision. There were half as many working journalists in the United States as there had been 15 years earlier. And so what that means is you had a news media which was half the resource, half the energy, half the strength of what it normally had been in recent American history. He said, the recommendations algorithm at YouTube is designed to optimize watch time. There is no reason that it would show content that is good for kids. If it does show content that's good for kids, that's just a coincidence. Again, this is Ed Williams, who was co-founder of Twitter and who now runs Medium. And Ed said this to the New York Times, he said, the trouble with the internet is that the internet rewards extremes. So say that you're driving down the road and you see a car crash, of course you look, everybody looks at a car crash. The internet interprets that to mean that people want car crashes and to, so it tries to give us more of them. Okay. That's that's good. Like let's let's just pause there because there's there's a lot that she went through. Uh, you know, Sue explained um, why fake news tends to be spread more virally than real news. Uh, it fits with what people want to hear. Uh, titles like 
Popeye's manager arrested for allegedly dipping chicken in cocaine-based flour to increase business sales, or death row inmate eats an entire Bible as his last meal is way more compelling than real-world headlines like Olympics represent Djokovic's time to shine brightest. Right? Like, which one's more compelling to you? <laughs> the fake news one! The fake news one is way more compelling. Uh, and an AI that is set up to get more comments and shares and watch time will not be fine-tuned to look for things like fake news. And this is one of the reasons why tens of thousands of human reviewers had to be employed by big tech companies like YouTube and Facebook, uh, as AI often has a hard time determining the difference between real and fake news. Uh, in fact, I had the opportunity uh, or the pleasure to interview uh, Professor Sarah Roberts on this topic. Uh, and maybe if I can pull this up, let's see what she had to say. Hold on. Why did Bill Nye say that critical thinking is the most important skill for young people to develop? And who reviews all of the news and posts that we see on our social media feeds? What is the right amount of social media that is good for our mental health? I'm Dr. E.T. and this is Ed on EdTech. I was at the California EdTech Professionals Association conference with our partner ClearTouch, and a lot of our keynotes were very focused on the need to teach critical thinking in school. But why is this so important when AI automatically checks everything that we post? Sarah Roberts had some eye-opening insights into the people who are responsible for reviewing our social media feeds. So wait, you're saying, yeah. you're telling me that what Mark Zuckerberg is saying isn't quite exactly the truth? Uh I'm saying that a lot I'm saying that a lot of the platforms that we use every day whether it's Facebook or whether it's something that seems as benign and uh and neutral as, you know, Google search, you know, which is literally a white box that you just type into, has all sorts of uh, complex socio-cultural and political values baked in, in no small part because they're associated with economics and particularly with revenue generation. But if we think about that apparatus, that policy apparatus in a bigger picture, I mean, we're really talking about a platform's value system or its politics. Uh, people who were working as these kinds of content evaluators were located actually all over the world. So the first group I encountered uh, and became aware of was actually located in agricultural central Iowa. You mentioned the Philippines. That is a hugely important um, hub for this kind of work and for other kinds of uh, outsourced knowledge work, particularly in the context of the United States and North America because of many, many decades of long-standing relationships, let's put it, uh, between the U.S. and the Philippines. The U.S., of course, occupied the Philippines for most of the 20th century. Young people who are trying to navigate these spaces that are filled with tons of garbage. Uh, the more sophisticated our teachers can be and our librarians can be about this ecosystem, the better prepared we are to help our young people navigate and really understand what's good and what's not so good about the information landscape they're in. Despite the advances in AI, much of the content on the internet is still evaluated by people under increasing time pressure. And what this means is that for us viewers, it's up to us to determine whether or not the content that we see and evaluate if it's true or not. <laughs> okay, so I hope that's helpful. Um, you know, while it does help to have people moderating news, it doesn't mean that we won't see fake news in our newsfeed. I still regularly get fake news sent to me, uh, and I still rely on fact-checking tools like Snopes or PolitiFact uh, that looks into the validity of these sensational headlines. Sarah Roberts has gone into great depth just about how our content is moderated, and she's also looked at you know, the kinds of people who do it, how much time do they have? What are the guidelines that they have? And of course, there is bias in that as well. It is not a perfect system. Um, it is 
potentially better than using an AI to try to detect fake news because this is a weak point of AI. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we have such a high investment in so many people, like tens of thousands of people who need to review content on a regular basis, but it's not perfect and fake news can still go through. This is one of the hardest things for a computer to determine is like, what's the difference? All I know is that this content is really, really popular. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why it tends to, to get a lot more views.